Good afternoon, good afternoon. My name is Eric Wright. I teach African American Humanities at Valencia College. I teach African American Studies at UCF. Um, I'm going to try to stick to my script. Demas told me I got 15 minutes, and if I said try to say everything, if I don't stick to my script, I'll run over like I do in my classes when I come into class thinking I don't have anything to say and I'm holding, holding them like. You can't more into what? Oh, okay, then I'll stretch. Um, I'm here to talk about the processes, processes by which. African cultural traditions are transformed in the new world. When I was in college and the, when I was in graduate school in the 80s at UCLA, and I was just getting into African American studies through my participation in the African Studies program, um, there was a senior classmate of mine named Joseph Holloway. And he had just come out with a book called Africanisms in American Culture. And the story, it was a collection of articles by um, different scholars talking about the different ways that African elements are represented in African American culture. The reason it was a big deal at the time was that unlike some of the other cultures in the African diaspora, particularly in the Caribbean world, in African American culture in the United States, you don't see direct connections, direct links to the African heritage. What you see are remnants. And one of the first scholars to start pointing this out was a researcher in the 1930s working for the um, Works Progress Administration. His name was Lorenzo Dow Turner. And he went through the South as part of his grant, and he collected over 3,000 words that, well, the same words in um, African cultures. He collected 3,000 words. Some were Mende, some were um, Congo, and some were Igbo. And along with him during that time, Zora Neale Hurston was working in Florida and in Haiti, and she was collecting folk tales. Folk tales that had African scripts, but not always African, African characters. But one in particular had this weird African character named Buki. And Buki only appears in a couple of places. Buki, the character, appears in Florida, and he appears in the French colonies in the New World. And since I was interested in folklore, I began to try to get a, a sense of where this character Buki comes from and what it, what, he, what it means. And back then, you didn't have online search engines. You had card catalogs. You had libraries full of dusty old books, and the UCLA Research Library had this collection of folk tales that were collected by missionaries all over the Caribbean. So I started picking through all those books, and some were in French, and I didn't read a lick of French. Um, some were in Spanish, I didn't read Spanish. But I did recognize when I saw that word, Buki. Zora Neale Hurston spelled it B O O K Y. Um, in Haiti, Buki is spelled B O U Q U I. Um, I think in Jamaica, Buki is B O O K I E. Buki always appeared with a rabbit. Or in Haiti, just a bad actor. Um, in Haiti, the Buki stories are about Buki and Tima Lise. And when I began to do some more, some deeper research, I discovered that the character Buki comes from West Africa, particularly from like Senegal, um, Mandinka culture, Sierra Leone, Liberia. And the story of Buki, Buki is what they call hyenas. So the Buki stories are about hyenas and rabbits. How old are they? And the Buki story represents 
an example of an Africanism. There are other blends of culture, other ways that African cultures are represented in the New World. Um, more prominently are what we call syncretizations, when there are when different cultures come together. And the way syncretization is used is, is describing a cultural element that is a blend of European and African cultures. The one that's most easily pointed out is the religious elements in um, Lukumi Santeria religion, where they say the syncretizations of Yoruba deities with an overlay of Catholic deities. Um, something similar happens in Umbanda in Brazil. When people talk about synchronizations, I always get upset because the one thing that they miss when they talk about the about syncretization is that the first blend of cultures in the New World came from people who came from different parts of Africa. So you had Yoruba and Congo coming together. You had Igbo and Pante people coming together. You had Mende people and Congo people coming together. And they had to construct new languages, new ways of communicating, new ways of sharing experience, and new ways of building their worlds out of their shared experience. Syncretization. The next level of blending that people talk about is creolization. Um, my parents are from East Texas, and I shouldn't say my, well, my parents are from East Texas. My sister, as long as my, other, my older sister isn't around, my favorite sister married a Creole man, a French Creole man. Do not tell my brother-in-law, Frank, that he is anything but black. Because if you do, he will rain down all sorts of hell on you. Okay? Um, creolizations are applied to look sort of like the offspring of European masters and African slaves. They are a cultural group that's sort of stuck in the middle politically. And creolizations appear not only in, in genetic mixing, but also in cultural practices. So obviously, in our neck of the woods, the, the first idea, or the most prominent example of creol creolizations are, is within the Haitian community, which they speak Creole, Creole. It's a blend of African and French languages. And then there's like this third level that we call ethnogenesis. And that's something that's um, sort of new to me, but discovering about ethnogenesis like blew my mind because it answered all the questions that I hadn't been able to answer. Me as a aspiring jazz musician, I always wanted to know, to know where blue notes came from. And everywhere I looked for about the origins of blue notes, I got me five books on my bookshelf that talk about the search for the blues in Africa. And as I go through those books, and I'm about 500 pages in on my three favorite books about search for the blues in Africa, I come up with two conclusions. One, people love the blues, and they have traveled all over the Africa in search of the blues. Two, they ain't found nothing. <laughs> because if the blues came from Africa, then the blues would be all over the African diaspora. But the blues is something that happened uniquely to the African-American experience in the United States. And there are a number of reasons why it happened here. But one of the most important reasons is that people came together they brought their different elements of culture with them. They were largely isolated from larger groups of people in their community who shared the same cultural heritage. 
And so they got to work right away on creating something new. And it's the thing that they created that gives them a sense of identity. It says who they are. That's why Amiri Baraka entitled his book, Blues People. That's his description of what African American people in the United States are. They are blues people. That is their identity. So my first impression of Bomba was that, oh, it's a creolization. Obviously, they got African drumming. And they got African drumming. And they have like these old colonial dresses. And then they're sort of doing like this, this nice little fancy dance. It ain't like the Cuban rumba where there's all kinds of arms and hips and booty shaking. It's about, am I wrong? Well, the dance tells the guy when she moves, the skirt is just him when he's gonna play. Right, but it's not like, it's not like the dancers in the Cuban rumba I was going to say something in bios, was listening to the music, and you started moving. Um, African dance is unique, and Africans dance uniquely. And my first experience of realizing the power of that kind of dance was when I was playing with a, a supus band led by a guy named Ricardo Limpo. And we were in Seattle, and there was a prominent Congolese community in Seattle. And apparently, Ricardo knows everybody who's from the Congo in Seattle, in Seattle. I think everybody from the Congo knows everybody from the Congo anyway, for some reason. But when the Congo, there was this, there was this one dude named Wawali. Wawali came up on stage and he started singing chorals. And then when Wawali started dancing, I was like, oh my God, there's something else going on here because he was dancing harder than any of the guys in the band. He was doing things that, well, that was like 2001. I had never seen dancers do before. Um, so that's why I say there's a distinction between African dancers and bomba dancing. Bomba dancing looks somewhat refined compared to African dancing. But when I went to, see and meet Taka Zapeda this summer when she was teaching a class and I did like I usually do, I arrive late and I came in the middle and I was observing her as she was teaching the class and she was going through the movements and you know she had teaching the, the students the movements and she asked her daughter to come up and dance and her daughter Barbara Lees came and did a demonstration and then she asked Barbara's daughter, her granddaughter, to come up and dance. And the little girl came up and she did this beautiful dance. It was like really powerful. And then she kept on teaching. And at one point she stopped and she asked the students, she said, why are you studying bomba? Why do you want to learn bomba? And they all had their own individual story. Well, you know, my parents are from Puerto Rico, and you know, I want to keep in touch with my heritage. Oh, you know, I just love dancing. I love the drums. Oh, you know, well, uh, I'm really Greek, but my friend is from Puerto Rico, and I just came to be with her because, you know, it seemed like it's interesting. Oh, I'm just interested in dance. And she went around the room, and she stood there, and she looked very stern and very serious. And I'm like going, ooh, somebody about to get a whooping. And after they all went through their answers, she said, the reason you should be doing this is because it's an expression of your heritage and your identity. And that's where ethnogenesis comes in. That's when Bomba became something that was not a blend of African rhythms and colonial dances from the 18th century and colonial dresses from the 18th century. It's something that these people created 200 years ago and they continue to do it to this day because it says something about who they are. 400 years ago. Four months. <laughs> it's, it's even yeah. before that. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm going to start saying this song about 400 years. <laughs> 400 years ago. In the processes of becoming a new people. And for me it's really remarkable because for the last year and a half I've been studying the um, transatlantic slave trade database. And I've been, when you play around with that, you can sort of do a visualization of the, number of the ships that came across the ocean. And you can sort of identify in the historical record when people came to different parts of the New World and where they came from. And Puerto Rico has a curious record because there weren't a lot of, fun, a lot of Africans who came to Puerto Rico. Only about 30,000. And of those 30,000 people, the first group of them came in like the 17th century, and the next group came late in the 18th century. So there's time for that first group of people to become something other than African people to become some kind of Puerto Rican people. And then there's time for that next group of people to be assimilated into this Afro-Puerto Rican culture and to bring new elements from Africa. And after that, 200 years later, for, <laughs> for the last two, 200 to 400 years, they've been doing something new. And what Bomba represents is that new thing that people are doing. It's who they are, how they move, why they move, and what the music means. Today you're going to get like a beautiful example of synchronization. Because we have Dima Sanchez representing the Bomba tradition in Puerto Rico. We have Bayo representing the Yoruba tradition of music. And we have Tobos representing uh, Congo traditions. You know, this is what happened 400 years ago when a couple of guys were sitting out on a day off and they decided to pick up some drums and play what they knew and they started playing together and they made something new. Let's get started. Thank you, Eric. Um, uh, I want to thank also Thomas Lubamba, a percussion and dancer for being here, and also Olavayo from Pinola from Nigeria. I want to thank Eric Wright for you know, doing this wonderful presentation. I, I, I am going to ask questions to him later yes, yes. also. Uh, and my name is, is Tima Sanchez. I am from Puerto Rico. And to explain something for those of you that probably don't know what Bomba is, uh, today I brought two instruments. And they are called, actually, Bombas. Uh, also, they are called Barril the Bomba or Bomba Battle because the enslaved people that came to Puerto Rico, uh, the only thing that had available to build the drums that they knew, it, it was barrels of wine, barrels of gold, etc. So they took those barrels, and this is a typical representation of it. It comes exactly from a barrel, but the technique that is used to build the drum. Um, I don't know if that's a new genesis or authorization or what, but basically it's very African, because see the pets are value. You told me that this is from Baghdad. You told me that this is from So we have similar like this, but we call it Bata, yeah. and it has two like this, but they used the to use hand to play it, and the animals came to play the other side. So, and we have something like this also in Nigeria that we used to play before, before I was born and before I become an artist. So, 
this is similar. So when I met them in the festival, and my wife was telling me that so you need to work with these people, what they are doing is what you are doing from your roots. So and I, we try to work on that. We come on that. So it's Pata. We have Pata from Yoruba tribe. And we have something like it that we used to play also. So similar to this. So we are the same. Yeah. The, these two drums. So, so this, this comes from the Puerto Rican Afro Puerto Rican tradition. Uh -huh. uh, now, this, what most people call conga, yeah. which actually the actual name is tumbadora, it comes from the Afro Cuban tradition. And also, the Cheque, which Bayo has one, yeah. also, it comes from the Afro Cuban tradition, which comes actually directly from Nigeria, because when Eric was talking about secretization, and he said he talked about the Lukumi tradition, which they are Yoruba, and they still sing it in Cuba in the Yoruba language. And actually, by the way, people here that actually still doing that in a religious form. Yeah, I have a group here that we used to dance together. We play drums for the Orishas, and when they are playing, and this is my culture, this is what you are doing. So, and I say, like, I'm home because I moved from Ohio down to. So, I'm like, I'm home. So, whatever you have when you feel at home is your home. No matter that you have to go to the area to say, I'm home. But here is home. Florida is home because it's more diversity of culture. So, when I see that playing Shekere and they are playing, the traditional music. And I say, this is Bata dance, but the way they play is different. The way I was born, how we do it in Nigeria. But it's the same thing, because that step is just need to change at the day. So, please check it right here and I say, this is my culture. And this is from Yoruba tribe. And it, it, you see the stuff that I wear, the cloth is from Yoruba tribe. So, this check we used to play it for king. For ceremony, so they used to play this uh, for any ceremony. So. Oh, okay. Uh, and then, Thomas, can you talk to us about the instrument that you have there? Uh, uh, we're going to do something very soon, very interesting with Thomas, because I find out that rhythms that we have in Puerto Rico from the Bomba tradition are actually in the Congo tradition. So, Cuba had a lot of Nigerian people, Yoruba. Um, Puerto Rico had a lot of Congo people, and also Haiti had a lot of Congo people. And uh, actually, Cuba, Cuba had from everywhere Every because, because because Cuba had Congo, Cuba had Nigeria, Cuba Cuba had people uh, from the African countries. Yeah, from the Calabar area. Yeah. And one thing that I'm going to say is that some of the cultures that came, which started started coming actually in the Caribbean a little bit earlier than the United States. You have thought that if you have heard of the United States talking about 1619, well in 1519 there, there were all already African enslaved people in Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of them were from Senegal and they started fighting immediately. So, so they didn't bring them anymore. Uh, and, and then all uh, at all the centuries, through the centuries, different people brought different slaves. Uh, so, Portugal, Dutch, the British. So, for that reason, came so many people from different parts of Africa. So, Thomas, talk, talk about the drum that you have there um, from the Congo tradition. We got the Ngoma. This is called Ngoma. Let me tell you something. You see, there are two different styles. This one is the original one. That's back on the day. Man. Uh, this one is the new generation because the original one, you need to put on the fire to turn around. Man. This one, we use the rope that they are everybody using just to keep it high. But most is more this one. And I hear the man talking about the tumbar tumbarero, the, the one. That we got one the drums, we call it the tumba. You see the name tumba is coming from far away. We have the, 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 the drum from the tumba. It's like a, here they call it like a snake drum. It's a guy it like the, we put the, the black thing on the top to make it a little bit. Yeah, 
Yeah. Like they do with the Bata drums also. Yeah. Yeah. And the Bata drums, we got the same style, but we call it Bai in Congo. You can play with the two styles, more the religion. Oh, okay, yeah. so, so you have Bata drums. So, yeah, we got the Bata, we call it Bangi, but that's more the religion that we call it, we play on the two sides. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and Nigeria has that two sides also. Yes, yeah. but the only thing we call it Bata, we call it Bangi. Bangi. Okay. It's more the prophecy, religion, that's why the white, the religion, yeah. the white, uh, yeah. for the, the spirit. Yeah. What? Yeah. Let's do something so people can't hear. What, one thing that, because I interviewed Bayo and Thomas before to prepare for this, so one thing that surprised me actually was that there is a rhythm for a record called Sika, and it's played like this. very famous by Cortijo and Ismael Rivera in Puerto Rico. But then when I started playing that rhythm, what did you tell me those? Sika in my language is new. 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 Uh, and bomba? Bomba is a keep. Keep secret something. So bomba is like a secret. Secret. Keep it to you. <laughs> so the word the word bomba actually exists in the Ah, and this is another thing in the Lingala language. Well, yeah. how many how many languages do you speak in in Congo? We got like we got but no no more we got like a six national language. There we got like uh, seven hundred thirty six dialects in Congo. Wow. Okay, yeah. can you manage that? <laughs> yeah. I don't say. <laughs> Uh, uh, Bible, how many languages do you have in? Um, we have 355 different languages in Nigeria. 300? Yeah. And in Yoruba tribes, we have one Yoruba board, different dialects, different tones in Yoruba. It's the only Yoruba is, is speaking very different. You go to another city, the way they will say it is different the way they if I don't say it or your or Sean and this, that is your man. Yeah. Yeah. Can you play the sick with the moment? Very interesting that I recognize that rhythm as the drum circle rhythm. Everywhere you go in the United States, you'll find people gathering and drum circles, uh, particularly in African-American communities. And the rhythm that they begin with and they end and they play for hours and hours upon end is... That's the foundation. Then everyone else accompanies them, or everyone plays that rhythm. Uh, and I have to say, before we start playing, I start playing with uh, with Thomas and Biden. I have to say that that rhythm is basically this. Because, and then it's called Sinquillo. Well, in Cuba they call it Sinquillo because it has five pages. And if you listen well, that rhythm is in the second line in New Orleans. And uh, when you go to New Orleans and you see that people play the tambourine, basically what they are playing, I don't have to, I forgot to play the tambourine, it, it's basically like... And then the drums doing, you know, they're sing, in the second line, you know, that it was used for funerals and sing. But let's, let's play a little bit, I'm going to do the sika. Uh, there are different parts. Yeah. Uh, I didn't finish the talk, let me, let me finish my... Uh, they, they call it Sika, but in Congo we call it Chacho. Sika? Sika, uh, which Chacho, and you told me that Sika is one of many accompaniments. Yes. So, so Sika is the fourth accompaniment, you told me. Yes, the fourth accompaniment. What is the other accompaniments that you have? When we play the one, pair. The first one. Thank <laughs> you. 
compartment and the second compartment is that we call it a polo. Actually, 
came from more than what is Congo today. We were telling me that was the biggest thing. The nation of Congo and the empire of Congo came. And this point to the people. Yeah, the Congo from the, the normal, the Congo came, this is the origin of the origin of the before was the Kingdom Congo. You get the both the Congo uh, Democratic Republic, uh, the Congo uh, Popular, Angola, Gabon, Cameroon, all before back on the day was like the Kingdom Congo. With the king. Okay, uh, there is another there is another rhythm or oh, want to say so, there is another rhythm is called the what? From and then you told you told me that uh, let me see I have to remember the name of the Aguaya. Aguaya, yeah. Aguaya. Yeah. So so this is this is a six A rhythm. Yes, six A rhythm. Uh and actually this rhythm you are in Puerto Rico, it's associated with the Asian people that moved to Puerto Rico because that's another thing, Puerto Rico. No they didn't come so many Africans like in Haiti or Cuba. But there came people from different islands because the, the Spaniards had the tradition that if you so escape from the English, the British, we will make you free. Here. They wanted, they wanted to destabilize the other. So if you if you escape from the French, we will make you free. So there was a video in Puerto Rico that the majority of black people were free. It was called Cangrejos, mm. which is today Santurce, Carolina, City. So so the Uruguay is associated with the Creole, the people that came from Haiti after the Haiti Haitian Revolution, which was 1804. Mm -hmm. And also, something similar is played in Santiago de Cuba, Santiago de, de, of Cuba, uh, called Tumba Frances. So let me play uh, the Tumba. And then I know that I have also some patterns for 6 a yeah, I, I can say something again on the from the Jaguaya. When I last time I'm long time ago I'm working with the Asian people, when I try to play they call it they call the rhythm and then Congo. Congo? Yeah. And from A they call it Congo, Jaguaya. Oh okay. Now you see that's what the thing is that's kind of on the same place. Oh okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 like we were talking about the Cicada, so play in New Orleans, mm -hmm. it was playing Congo Square. The, f the famous Congo Square, which is now uh, the Louis, uh, Louis Armstrong Square. So, so let's play you one. 